Award shows, Emmys, Grammys, uh, Oscar, you know what I mean? Uh, Oscar, like that's a person. Oscars. Uh, if heaven has that kind of ceremony when we get our rewards, brothers and sisters, I mean the Hudson is going to have more diamonds in his crown than you all, okay? You seen bust down watches? He's going to have a bust down crown. It's going to have like from Icebox yeah. and like all the rappers, what they have. He's going to have that in heaven and he's going to take that and lay it at the feet of Jesus. I am honored, brother, to be just in your shadow. And uh, if you continue to pour into me, I'll one oh, day okay. be half of the man that you are. Once again, I mean the dream Hudson. Please, yes, yes. <laughs> this must what it must be what it's like to shake the president's hand. <laughs> because uh, after that performance that we saw today, I, I, again, uh, I think that if heaven has a, a residency program like Las Vegas does for artists, uh huh. Uh, you will be the person in residence in heaven for eternity. What? I thought it was Chris No Tomlin. one else. No. <laughs> I think that if you get there, the Lord's going to be like, with all due respect, Chris Tomlin, we love you, but heaven prefers KBs. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that you're going to be performing when we all get to the gates. God bless and I you, think brother. that Peter is going to be uh, listening to you in the heavenly AirPods. Nice. As he's checking off who's supposed to come in. Nice. <laughs> Nice. So, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you for indeed. that introduction. For sure. <laughs> so, Southside Rabbi, uh, we take very serious uh, what Paul uh, t tells the, the the folks in Romans yeah. uh, to outdo one another in showing Show love. honor. Yeah. Okay? And uh, so, we start every episode seeing who can out honor who. The problem is, I mean, is so prolific oh, that I don't have a chance. So I'm always out honored, and uh, but it humbles me and uh, it keeps me at the feet of Jesus. You, so uh, I, I just be, it's just because you're going to out honor us all in heaven. So now, you know, we just wow. have to do it. We have to get it out the way okay, now. Okay, I concede. I concede. Um, <laughs> so we are here with with with, with Stand for Life, yeah, and amen. means he talked to us a little bit about uh, what Stand for Life is and yeah. and the. Thing that we are doing here now. Yeah, uh, well, Stand for Life is an organization that is, as the name says, standing for life um, and in a way that is holistic mm -hmm. um, and that cares about the whole person. Mm -hmm. So as you saw us earlier, we were talking about issues of uh, like pro-life issues. We were talking about uh, abortion. And of course, we are tackling that. Stand for Life is also tackling that. But Stand for Life is also uh, seeking to be uh, an organization that stands for life in a holistic sense. So it's not just yeah. when we're talking, it's not just the unborn, yeah. but we're also talking about what it may they're also talking about what it means to be made in the image of God and how the image of God is supposed to be protected protected and preserved in a way that is wide and deep yes. um, and in a way in which God uh, God is is honored by and glorified by. Yes. And so uh, that's what we are promoting Yes, and uh, that's who we are partnering with and we are honored to do so. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh -huh. And of course we do have uh, royalty and prestige here oh, with yes. us. Oh, yes. Beyond, I mean, believe it or not, there is uh, there's more greatness <laughs> to enter this conversation. Uh, the founder uh, of this uh, holistic approach to life and this emphasis on the image of God being expressed in an organization, the founder of Stand for Life, is here with us today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, oh, gird your loins. Okay? <laughs> gird them. Uh, our, our dear sister is... Uh, has been a, a just a powerful powerhouse for philanthropy uh, and support, and her own story has led her to help shape this organization. And we will get to sit down with her today, ladies and gentlemen. Make some noise for Lauren Green McAfee. <laughs> is that the chair? Is it? There's not a throne. Is there a throne that we can? Crown on it. Perfect. Yes, indeed. So, we got to hang out. We actually just met uh, for the first time today, and we've been talking ever since yeah. uh, we, we've, we've gotten together. You have a unique story regarding the work that you do. 
Yep. But also how you arrive to this pro life pro life conversation. So help us understand Dr. Lauren. And I call her Dr. Lauren yes. because of her how profound she is. <laughs> but she is working on her PhD. Okay. So uh, so anyways, yeah. talk to us about who you are and then how you kind of got into this organizational effort. Yeah, great. Well, I I grew up in a Christian family, and so the pro-life issue was something that I would say I always you know, my family would say they were pro-life. And it was something I believed t- until, you know, in my head, until there came a moment in my life where it was like, okay, there's actually a situation where I have to put my money where my mouth is mm. and and see like, okay, if it's actually going to cost me something, do I still believe that? Mm. And so for me in my life, that was when my family, so my family, um, my grandpa founded and uh, runs Hobby Lobby, the the company. And Shout so my Hobby Lobby, baby. Shout out. <laughs> you know what I mean? my family's like the Hobby Lobby Green family. And there came a situation where, um, with HHS mandate a number of years ago, the government was forcing companies to provide and pay for abortifacient drugs and devices. Mm. And so, for my family owning a business, that meant the government was saying, "Hey, you, as a privately held family business." Mm-hmm we're saying you have to pay for these things, mm. pay for yeah. abortifacients. Wow. And that went against our convictions about life. And so we were faced with a decision, okay, do we comply with what the government is saying? Or if we didn't comply, then we would be faced with a $1.2 million fine every day. Wow. $1.2 million a day. Daily. Daily, daily for being out of compliance with this mandate. Man, wow. So not sustainable, right? No, like, you, not you know, at all. You can't, can't do that for long. So our family had to decide, okay, if we, if we don't follow the government's mandate, then, you know, that means we could risk you know, losing the company, yeah. losing things. And so we, we filed a lawsuit that led to the Hobby Lobby Supreme Court case where, where we won. Um, but through that experience, huh. I was not only we were having to say, okay, these are convictions that actually mean something and uh-huh. that there, there could be a cost. And right. there, there, even though we didn't uh, lose, there was still a cost yeah. in mm. like having to walk through sure. that. Sure, right, right. Media, media. Was, this, all of it was just, it was intense. Yes. Um, but it also was a beautiful um, uh, season where I was getting to see pro-life workers all throughout the country reaching yeah. out to our family, thanking us for the stand that we were making. Yeah. And so that was my introduction to the pro-life movement. And yeah. since then, ah. I've just I've been really engaged in the issue. Love it's it. what led me to want to do the PhD in, in public theology around women's reproductive health yes, and the indeed. Imago Day. Yes. Um, uh, but so that was kind of my entrance into the work of pro-life. But then personally, I also um, I'm a third generation adoptive parent. So mm, my yes. grandparents adopted my parents um, adopted one of my sisters. And so then whenever Michael and I, my husband, were looking to start our family, we yeah. wanted to pursue adoption. So we went that route mm-hmm. and we adopted our daughter Zion from China. Uh-huh. And then we started pursuing a domestic adoption yeah. in, in the state where we live. Mm-hmm. And through the domestic adoption process, we went with an agency that wanted us to have an open adoption relationship with the birth parents if that was what the birth parents wanted. Right, and we were right, very right. excited about that and the opportunity to to not only care about inviting a child into our family, but also the birth pa- parents, the yeah, birth mom, amen. inviting yes. her into our family too Absolutely. and caring for her. Right, right. And walking alongside a number of women that we we were um, matched with at different times mm-hmm. and seeing just their real life circumstances that they were facing yeah. and in the midst of an unplanned yeah. pregnancy yeah. changed my life and my view and even another um, just more personal level of seeing, you know, you're walking side by side with someone who's just in the trenches of really unbelievable circumstances. Yes. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the birth moms that I have had a really great relationship with, she was a teenager facing an unplanned pregnancy. Um, she was an orphan herself oh, and was man. just trying to finish high school. And she had her her grand, a grandparent had raised her and then that grandparent had passed away. So she oh. really had no one. Wow. And I was like, how, you know, I can't imagine walking in those shoes and having to also face this pregnancy. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. getting to care for her and just see the courage that she had to keep that pregnancy 
yeah. um, gave me a lot of empathy for women facing unplanned pregnancies sure. and saying, you know, that's a really challenging thing. And a lot yeah. of women have really challenging circumstances they're facing, yeah. um, which is why a lot of women think abortion is their best option. Mm. Right. Um, and so I don't want women to have to feel like abortion is their best or only option. Yes. Because that's not really having choice. That's yeah. having um, no good options. Mm. And so we want to... So with Stand for Life, I mean, we, I, my heart is to see women feel um, supported, loved, yes. cared for, and, and be able to connect with great resources that are going to be able to serve her mm -hmm. in whatever the circumstances, whether yeah. um, she's facing, uh, you know, housing challenges, right, right. Um, food scarcity, you know, trying to figure out a job, trying to figure out how she's going to take care of a baby, yes. um, all of those things that help make that decision for life. Um, feel really holistic and mm. supported in all of those areas and caring about her as a person that is an image bearer of God, yeah. as well as the child in her womb, yes. which is equally valuable, yes. equally as Amen. valuable as her, Come on. and seeing the value there in both. Amen. That's powerful. Amen. That phrase, it's not really a choice, it's just you don't have any good, good options, yeah, yeah, yeah. is powerful, mm -hmm. and there is tons of research to support that. Yeah, yeah. The research is crystal clear that most women who get abortions are often doing it in a way where they feel like their hand is being forced. Yeah. They, they, they feel like I, there isn't an alternative. Here is the path. Yeah. And then there are organizations that are, would then market to that kind of person yeah. and say, not only is this, uh, you know, and an, an, an option. This is your best option. In fact, this is the noble, the moral option right, for right. you. There's uh, uh, pushes to, there, there are all kinds of campaigns uh -huh. to sort of shape what should be uh, the uh, an, an option that isn't at the front of the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are campaigns to put it there at the front of the line. Yeah. And I appreciate this idea. When you get a chance to walk through adoption and you see what these mothers are walking mm -hmm. through, yeah. I, it, it reminds me of this uh, passage uh, in Matthew. Uh, excuse me, I believe it's Luke. Uh, if I had my laptop, I could look it up and be more accurate. Forgive me. We live, okay? <laughs> um, but Jesus is walking down the road of suffering, and there are the daughters of Jerusalem in the audience watching him as he walks to Calvary. Right. And the daughters of Jerusalem are crying. They're weeping, right? And as they are weeping, Jesus stops for a moment and looks at them and uh -huh. begins to commiserate th with them in their pain. And he says to them, don't cry for me. Yeah. Cry for yourselves. Yeah. Um, and he says that the day will come where people will, re will rejoice that that they will rejoice in the fact that they were childbearing, that they didn't have children, yeah. that things would become so bad for them that they would be grateful that they didn't have a child in that circumstance. Mm. Yeah. And he was speaking about the coming wrath. Mm. And, he re and he refers to himself as this green tree that when fire hits the green tree, when I get on the cross and the wrath of God falls on me, I get back up in three days. Mm. But if the wrath of God falls on you, mm -hmm. There is no yeah. getting back up. So it may seem like, though I have the cross and that I am dying, that I am the disadvantaged one, but I, I am not. Mm -hmm. You are if you haven't trusted me. Right. That was his point. Right. But I, it's unique to me that Jesus realizes that it is possible to grow up in a set of circumstances circumstances where childbearing is difficult. Right. It's hard. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate the honesty here mm. to be able to say, I can see you, commiserate with you mm -hmm. that this is a multifaceted issue. Now, how do we create a climate, a culture yeah. where the option that God is pleased with yeah. is at the forefront because of the way that we are serving? Right, 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 right. right. Mm -hmm. In Stand for Life, there's curriculum. Yeah. Talk to us about yeah. the ways in which that curriculum actually takes God's best option for us and yeah. puts it at the forefront. Amen. Yeah, so Stand for Life create a, a six-week Bible study that's a curriculum that churches can use, anyone can use, um, that really helps walk through those 
theological foundations yeah. that help give us the reason why we should care about this issue, why we care yeah. about all uh, kind of human dignity issues, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. The life issue is certainly uh, the forefront of what we're talking about here today, but human dignity issues and, and the reason we care about human dignity issues from Scripture apply to a, a whole facet mm-hmm. of issues that we see in yes. our culture today, yes. whether Amen. it's you know standing up for against trafficking mm-hmm. or racial issues, yeah. um, even pornography, things yeah. like this mm-hmm. where people— Human beings are seen as a commodity or yeah. something to be taken advantage of. Mm. Um, there are so many issues in culture today that are really rooted in the human dignity um, and understanding the value of every single person yes. being an image bearer. That's good. And so we created this six-week curriculum. Our friend Benjamin Watson, your friend Benjamin Watson, yeah. did the, the video component with it. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. really nice. You can go through this study. You can read the content, but then you can also watch his videos um, and being, be able to just dive into, okay, what is our theological belief about the image of God? Um, the study is called the Image of God Bible Study. Yes. And, and then and kind of think through how to apply that into our lives. And so... That's a great resource. So people can find that. We can link to that for the curriculum on the nice. stanforlife.com website. But we also have, for anyone that's a bit more like wanting something even uh, at the next level. So I, I am a PhD student, so I always appreciate reading kind of yeah. these like professors yeah, and yeah. ethicists and yeah. theologians. And so Stand for Life was able to host a scholarly conference that was on the topic of the image of God. Ah. And so from those papers that were presented of the professors, we made that into a book. So yeah. there's a book yes. um, called Created in the Image of God yes. that is uh, professors, ethicists, theologians that have written on this topic of Okay, diving a little deeper, what does it look like to apply this understanding of the Imago Dei, image mm-hmm. barrenness, to cultural confusion today? Yes. Yeah. And so, creating the image of God, um, Dr. Doc, David Dockery and I got to edit that, and there's great it. articles in there. So, that's like an, another great resource that Stand for Life has been able to produce that hopefully will give people somewhere to go if you're kind of wrestling through some of these questions. I love yeah. it. It's good. I love that um, this is all rooted in the Imago Dei, the image of God, because uh, not only are we all made in the image of God, but I think that even those outside of the faith understand it. They may not know that that's what it is, but they even understand that when I see human suffering, there's something inside of me that says, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. Something should be done about this. Mm. This is not right that human beings are suffering in the way that they are. And they may not even understand, but what is what that is coming from is that they are made in the image of God and they're seeing the assault on other image bearers and they're saying something is very wrong here. Yes. Right. Cosmically. Yeah. Even when you look at, uh, we talked about this study that came out of Notre Dame that, that did, uh, that were talking about abortion and it showed that even for those who were pro-choice, a lot of folks did not see abortion as a common good. Yeah. Right. So, right. so, yeah. so though they may be uh, endorsing, the woman's ability to be able to do it, they still were like, oh, but we don't yeah. see this as a common good. We want to actually be able right. to try to, yeah, we actually want to be able to try to curtail this in some way, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I think that Good we point. cannot get, a, we cannot shake the fact that we are made in God's image yeah. and it comes out when we see the suffering. I think you're right on there that that is something that's like built into the heart of humanity. Yes. Like this, this kind of instinctive recognition of the value of life. Yes. It's why, you know, the, an instinct is to protect life. You yeah, know, if yeah, anyone's yeah. in like a life-threatening situation, your instinct is to protect life, protect your life, others' lives. Right. Um, and even on a secular level, organizations like the UN have the Human Dignity Declaration mm. where they've yes. made a declaration out of secular reasons. And right. so they don't really necessarily have the foundation of why right. yep. they're saying yep. that yep. we believe these things, like that <laughs> right. all people have these inherent values like dignity, right. um, but they're still acknowledging it, yeah. even if they can't point to why necessarily they believe that. Yeah. And yeah. so I think that 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 is helpful to know, okay, this is something that people can kind of innately sense in yes. themselves as we talk about the life issue. Um, and for the church, the church, when it lives this out well, oh, mm. it's just, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. beautiful. Yeah, and yeah, it, it draws people to the gospel when we live out our beliefs well. Yes. But when we don't live out those beliefs well, it can also be equally as destructive. Absolutely. Oh, yes, Whenever absolutely. we twist things and don't live it out yeah. uh, holistically. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, and so you look at the, the early church and whenever the early church was just forming 
uh, the Christians were very countercultural oh, yes. to the time period. Yep, and yep. you see Christians, one of the, you know, Tim Keller has talked about this, one of the ways that Christians lived out a very countercultural uh, religion and with their faith, this gospel faith, was by caring for vulnerable yes. and specifically caring for children yes. that were being thrown out and abandoned and aborted. Yeah. Um, yes. They, they, the Christians were the ones that were going out and finding yes. children mm -hmm. that had been thrown literally in trash heaps yeah. and adopting them into their families yes. and saying, hey, we care about life. We care about these children. Mm -hmm. um, it was raising the value and the dignity of how women were treated mm -hmm. in the church. Yes. You know, These were things that the early church did that were so countercultural and radical to the, the Roman culture that they were in that drew people to yes. this beauty of the gospel yes. and, and of, of this human dignity um, being a value that was lived out. And so, you know, I, 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 I pray that we will see a time and that we will see a, a, a day in our culture where the Christian church, the, the gospel-believing church will live out this conviction again yes. in a way that is so um, beautiful and loving that it does draw people in to not only uh, seeing the value of life and, and making life decisions, but ultimately to see the gospel Absolutely. and to see the hope of Jesus Christ yes. um, because of the beauty of the, this, this, his teaching that yes. we live out if we live it out well. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. Very well said. Um, I, I, I often uh, reflect on the fact that my conversion was, was, was very much, um, the result of going from a place where I thought that God, the Bible preaching church was just a, a center for boredom. Okay. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> likewise, this, this is where you go to sleep. Right. And um, I was like, the church is for sleep and eating animal crackers. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's what it country is time for. lemonade and going. That's yes. right. Uh -huh. yeah, right. And maybe uh, there'll be a peppermint. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's right. Maybe there'll be a and peppermint. If you went to a black church. They had that fan with Martin the King on the yes, back. Yes, and a funeral home and ad, a funeral on, the home ad on the yeah. back of it. Uh -huh. And so it, it was it, to, to me. It was like this. This whole thing of Christianity is just giving Nyquil all the time, mm -hmm. until in a Christian hip hop CD, mm -hmm. someone talked about what I like to call the flyness of Jesus. Mm -hmm. How how absolutely uh, strong he is. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew strength. I thought I knew yeah. what it meant to be feared or respected. Uh, in hip hop, it's money, power, and respect. That's the mantra. Mm -hmm. That's the mantra. Yeah. If you have lots of resources, then you're living. Well, who has more resources than the living God? Mm -hmm. who, is, who is the one that has planets, angels, and uh, all of life at his disposal? If you're talking about respect, oh. okay, you walk into a room, the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Wow, every tongue will confess. You want to talk about respect. He is that guy. Yes. And then you want to talk about power. Ooh. Romans 1.16, for it is the gospel of Jesus that is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe. Brothers and sisters, we ought to think about this often. Think about the stories of how God has taken men and women from various places in the world and laid them down for his kingdom Ooh. and said, you now work for me. Yes. Uh, and you yes. now serve me. Yes. And think about how you did the same to death. Yes. Because usually when the, when the culture talks about power, they talk about the power to be able to end your life or direct your life. Yes. And God says, I beat death. I beat death. The very thing that you threaten everybody with, no with your power. No one has been able to be victorious over death. I got it. Right. I even think as a as as a way of analogy, even what Hobby Lobby does, fifty percent of their profits are generously being given to kingdom yeah. efforts. Who is doing that kind of thing? Oh, the kind of people that love a God who is worth far more than we can ever imagine. Amen. He's just that fly. He deserves it. <laughs> yeah. And when I think about what I do for a living, uh, my job is to help you see how amazing he is in a more clear way. Mm -hmm. Because if you can see how dope God is, you won't have any trouble worshiping him. Mm -hmm. You will be obsessed with what you see. And one of the things that I think is so powerful about this image of God talk is where we get introduced to it in scripture. We see this in yeah. Genesis 1, 26, yeah. 27. But we often forget that the backdrop of Genesis is Moses giving this Theology 101, this God 101, 101 to a group uh -huh. of 
newly freed slaves. Yeah, who were marginalized, okay? oppressed. They were marginalized. They were put to the side. Okay. They had no rights. They were rescued out of uh, century, century-long subjugation. Yeah. They're brought out of this situation and they're free. And now they're like, who is this God that saved us? Yeah. We have a lot of th- ideas about who we are. Right. We are small. We are insignificant. We are, 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 are looked down upon. Yeah. We are hated because of our status. But this God has chosen us. Yeah. The living God out of all the nations came here. Why? <laughs> Moses says, I got you. Okay. Let's start with the first thing. Yeah. He is the creator of everything. It is not any of the gods of Pharaoh. None of the gods of the Nile. None of the gods in the ancient Near East. Uh He is the God, and he says that the spirit of God hovered over the waters. Now, we missed that. Uh Uh-huh. But ancient Near Near Eastern scholars say that the mind of those in the audience hearing that would say, hold up. You mean like God of the oceans? Yeah. Where all the strongest gods live? Yeah, all the chaos is? Yes. Yeah. Think about the plagues. Every single plague was a counterattack on a celebrity god of the Egyptians. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Y'all, you you guys think that he controls the rain? Watch this. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Yahweh is in control. So they're hearing that God is stronger than all the gods. And throughout the the Old Testament, um, you will hear this phrase, he is the God of gods, meaning that any God you bring to the table, he is above them all. Right. 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 And then after he says, after Moses helps them understand who God is, he then turns to these people and says, let me help you understand who you are. Mm -hmm. That God made you in his image. Mm -hmm. And that image demands a certain set of rights. Now we use the word rights often when we think about this conversation because we think about it legally. But when I say rights, I mean it way more broad than that. What I'm saying is the image of God is not to be taken advantage of because God takes his image so personal that an assault on his image is an assault on him. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah. So there are things that ought not happen. And when they do, it is a problem for God. Therefore, it has to be yeah. a problem for us. So at the heart of the image of God conversation is the heart of God. Yeah. What is Yahweh like? Yeah. What is he like? And it is important for us as we think through these issues that we realize that we're not just talking about legislation. We're not just yeah. talking about yeah. how you vote. We're not just talking about what person you put in positions of power to represent your agenda. We are talking about the very vision of God in the world. Mm-hmm. And you, dear brothers and dear sisters, have a responsibility through the way you live, you act, the way you talk online, the way you love your enemies, the way you care for the vulnerable in the womb and outside, to say true things about the character of God because that's what's at stake here. Mm-hmm. What's at, what is at stake here is the very revelation of God in our understanding. If we do not see God rightly, if we do not understand uh, the ways in which his image is to be uh, rallied behind, protected, yeah. and affirmed, yeah. then we lose the heart of God and God will not make adjustments for any of us. He is who he is, whether or not you recognize it or not. Mm-hmm. And what I'm saying, whether or not you recognize it, sorry, <laughs> that was a little weird. But God is inviting us in to take on the very purpose for which you were made. One more last thing about the image of God, and then I'm going to bounce past it. That is good. The image of God in the, Near e- in, the, in the ancient Near East, when there were images, okay, there, there, was, uh, there was an idea. It, it, there were several ideas of what it meant to have the image of a, of a, of a ruler or yeah. a king on you. One of the ideas was, and you still see this if you travel the world. So like I was just in Dominican Republic. You saw that there were images of the president all over yeah. the country. Uh-huh. There's billboards of him smiling with his wife. You go, the statues. The statues. Yeah. Uh, always reminding you. Always of who, reminding who's you. Who's in charge. Who's in charge yeah. and who is with you, right? right? Uh, it, 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 it's, it's to give this, the king is with it's the present, people. Right. He is present among the people. Right. So when... You hear that you're made in the image of God. God is intending for you to walk around as a billboard yeah. that the king is with you. Yeah. Another aspect of the image of God was functionality. The image did something. And that's when, that's when Moses starts saying, okay, so, you know, Adam is in the garden and uh, he's working. 
My man is, you think about paradise, it is not sandals, okay? It <sighs> is a, 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 a place where you are cultivating, being fruitful, multiplying, expanding. Yeah. The image of God does something. Right. And it's so beautiful that it mirrors what God does. Yeah. God is a working God. God is a God who gives names to things that give yeah. dignity. God is a God that is gives fruitfulness and shalom and wholeness. Yeah. God designed the garden to be in a place of absolute pleasure and joy and happiness, fullness, friendship, companionship. Yeah. All of those things that are tantamount to the kingdom of God were right there in the Garden of Eden as a reflection yeah. of his image. So where his image bearers go, they bring that vibe with them. And that's the last thing I'm going to say mm -hmm. is that the function of the image of God on us demands that we bring the flavor of our God and his kingdom into these issues that we are walking yeah. through. Because once again, the very character and vision of God is on the line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> at this point, we should probably open up for questions. Huh? <laughs> Yeah, let's do it. So we'll take a second now and uh, open up the floor for folks to ask questions. And and and, and, and doctor, could you stay up here with us? Yeah, lunch. okay, yeah. awesome. Uh, ask whatever. Any questions? Any bold souls? Okay, we got some. Okay. <laughs> I'll stand. I'm in the back. Yeah. Um, KB, something that you mentioned was that um, our truth ought to be narrow and our love ought to be wide. Yeah. Do you have an example of someone that you've seen that live that really well and like what they did to do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yes. Great, great question. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make this as controversial as I can. Um, I am particularly thinking about a situation. I mean, you are very, actually, you're aware of this uh, because me, you, and your, 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 your wife had a long conversation about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a friend of ours had a classmate um, who was um, um, transitioning, and um, and they had they had built a relationship. Uh, they were getting to to know each other. We were praying for an opportunity for our friend to share the gospel with this person, and and they were she was making in way, like she was making inroads. She was, there was getting closer. There was trust there. There was starting to be starting. There, there was some uh, confidence, like in terms of this, uh, this, this individual was starting to confide in our friend. And then they had a birthday party. Yep. <laughs> and at the birthday party, uh, they were going to have their community there. And we, and, and my friend got invited to that birthday party. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we sat down and talked about it. What should, should she go? What does that look like? Right. And I, before I could even hear the whole story, said, you should go. Mm -hmm. I think you should go to the birthday party. It was like at a Chili's, okay? Yeah. I mean, it it'd be one thing if it was, you know. It, yeah, it was, I don't, yeah. I won't even make the joke. Yeah. But uh, I think you should go. Yeah. I think you should go and take your Christian witness with you. Yeah. Here is an opportunity for you to mix it up. Bring your husband with you. Mm -hmm. Can I bring a few of my friends? Yeah. Here is an opportunity for us to meet in a neutral space where, again, you know where I stand on this. Yeah. You know that we don't see eye to eye. Now what? Once we have established that we don't agree on this, if there is grace, which often there isn't, but if there is grace for you to still want to see me tomorrow, if I'm still invited, though I don't agree, why would we shrink back from that? Yeah. I've already established where I am and I'm still, I still have a space in your life. Yeah. Oh, I'm going there and I'm going armed. Yeah. With the, the heart of God and the kingdom. And that's what I'm saying. Let me get one, one last thing. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking way too much. No, I'm tired. No, no, that stage was huge, okay? <laughs> they did not tell me that, okay? I'm running around that thing trying to catch my breath. I think I burnt 3,000 calories. All right. For those listening online, I, I just got done performing uh, with these, these great folks. Uh -huh. Anyways, uh, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, yeah. okay, is... That's a great example of it. It's this. a scandalous parable. Yes. Because Jesus is here talking to a group of religious folks, dissing other religious folks, okay? <laughs> He's saying... Me and I mean talked about this yesterday. Yeah. If that happened today, 
our favorite religious person, the folks that we all look at and say, that, that guy or that girl, they are close to God. Those people. If they were walking down the street, you know, let's say they, you know, are on their way to preach at some conference or whatever, and there's a person who is obviously been taken advantage of that is bleeding out in need of help, and they're like, help me. And that religious person we know walk by them to go preach. Most of us would not bat an eye at that. In fact, we would have a bunch of justifications, right? Justifications. Justifications that I've made myself when I didn't help somebody. Yeah. Well, I, come on, God, and one person. You know what I'm saying? What am I supposed to do? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Or, or I, I'm going to do your work somewhere else. Yeah. Or, or this seems unsafe. This seems this unsafe. This here is bloodied. I don't know. Is a drug deal gone bad? Is uh, it? A, I know, because that's where it also goes. Because yeah. then you start, and then, then if, and once, it, once it gets on Twitter. Is there a crime? Once it gets on Twitter, yeah. then folks are going to come out the woodworks and say stuff like, well, was he drinking? Yeah. Was he on drugs? Did he have a two-parent household? What are the things that are going on in his life that got them where on he the is, side of the road? Right, beat up. In other words, how is this their fault so I don't have to care? Mm. Okay? That's yeah. normal. In other words, who is my neighbor? And then that's... Yeah. That's what they're saying. And that's what and, I, and, 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 I just see Jesus sliding just, in like Just this. hold on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's the context. Who is my neighbor? But it's the context in which Jesus gives this parable, though, right? Yes, yes. Because the, it comes in the context of a guy saying, what must I do to have eternal life? Yes, yes, yes. And then he says, you know, love God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as your— Oh, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's and like, then he says, who is my neighbor? Great Samaritan. Yeah, the good, the good Samaritan. The good Samaritan. Yes. Uh, past, uh, it's, it's right there. No, absolutely. Yeah. We also know that what the Samaritan did was merciful. He, he, it was, he was not obligated to help this poor yeah. person. And the, he was the, the most unlikely to do it. And he was also the most unlikely person to do it. But Jesus looks at something that we would put in the category of just volunteering— <laughs> right? Or being merciful. Or he did something nice. He helped the old lady across the road. We put it in that category. Jesus puts the giving of mercy to someone in need, the neighbor, which was in your means to help. He puts that kind of action in the category of those who are actually saved. saved yeah. Of salvation, of evidence of salvation. Yes. Yeah. Not to earn. Yeah. yeah. But it shows us those who are truly walking with God because that's what God does. God is like the Samaritan picking you up from the side Say, of the road we the side. And, and on his dime taking care of you at the, the nearest Holiday Inn, okay? What I'm saying Amen. is there is so much for us to learn even from people who wouldn't name the name of Jesus. Samaritan was somebody who existed outside of the community of faith, brothers and sisters. What ways in which we can simply be helpful by proximity. Because we are around, mm -hmm. people are helped. Yep. Mm -hmm. That, what I think scripture would say to us, that's quintessential Christianity. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Quintessential Christianity is in love for neighbor that is driven by love for God. Yeah. We do not want to miss the love, love of God part. Because if you separate the love of God from the love of neighbor, yeah. then you may begin to idolize your neighbor. And I've seen it more times than you can imagine. I am from Southside St. Petersburg. There have been black liberation movements yeah. after black liberation movements that have tried to do things to help the plight of those living in food deserts and insecurity and yeah. things like that. Without God. With, but, <laughs> and then, but we say, well, Jesus belongs to the white folks. We're going to do this on our own yeah. merit. I have been, it's in my book. I tell a story about where I went to one group that was, is actually on the FBI watch list, yeah. and they probably should be. Uh, I went to their organization. They had like a, a, a group there, like a, 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 a center in yeah. the hood. I yeah. went there, and I'm having conversations with them, and then I brought up Jesus, and then they started telling me how I was colonized, and Jesus is a white man religion, and I was like, oh, I love this. <laughs> I say this all day. You're wrong, okay? <laughs> um, and, uh, but what you see is when you try to, have love disconnected from its source, you begin to cannibalize the people you say you try you right. are trying to love. Right. But when the love of neighbor is qualified by the love of God, it keeps your love pure. It keeps it humble. I'm spitting like crazy. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> it keeps your love genuine and sincere. And Jesus has simply said, it's not big and sexy and complicated. Yeah. It's not super nuanced and we don't need degrees for it's it. Very simple. Love me. 
Give yourself to righteousness and love those around you. On these two things, the entire law and prophets rest. Yeah. Do that thing. Yeah. Love wide, though our truth is narrow. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Another question. And I'm not talking no more. Y'all need to talk. That's all good. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So my question is that something I've seen in the Christian culture that there's shame put on people who've had abortions. Oh. And something that I want to learn is how do I love someone who's had an abortion? Oh, yeah, that's, to hear I'm so guess. glad you asked because I wanted to make sure and, and talk about that. So thank you for the question. Um, right. I mean, s abortion is sin. And so I'm not, I'm not going to be uh, shy away from that. But so are lots of other things. Mm -hmm. like, there are lots lying. of like lying, right. prideful, mm -hmm. selfish actions that I take part in every single day. You know, sin. Yeah. You know, every person is a sinner. And it's why we need the cross. Come on. We have to, whenever we talk about abortion, I think it can, it can be really hard because we know people or we, we know that there are people in our circles who have had abortions, who are touched by abortions. And, and so out of wanting to love them and not make them feel bad, maybe we don't want to talk about it. Mm. But I think that applies for, you know, a lot of areas of our sin. Um, and so the, the good news is that we have an example of Christ yes. who, as you were just talking about, like loved people so much that yes. he wanted them to know the truth. Yes. He wanted them to know there was hope and forgiveness. Um, and and Jesus went to the people that were considered like the most sinful in, yeah. in the tax collectors, uh, the woman at the well who yeah. had many husbands and was sleeping with someone that wasn't her husband at the time. Yeah. Um, he went to those people. Yes. And so, so, you know, I hope that we, when we talk about this, we look at Christ and his example of how he loved yeah. people. He saw them, uh, regardless of what their sin past was, he saw them for who they were. He loved them. He asked them about their lives and engaged with them mm. and also pointed to the truth because he loved them so much that he wanted them to know the truth Amen. of the hope of forgiveness. Yeah. Um, and so I think that can feel really hard, but with the abortion issue, any woman um, and any man who's affected by you know, a woman that has had an abortion, um, I just want to say, like, praise God, there is hope and forgiveness. Yes. And that that is found in Christ. Yes. And so that, of course, any sin can feel, it can have shame attached to it. But because of what Christ has done, we don't have to live in our shame. We get to live in the truth of the hope of our forgiveness because whenever we accept Christ and ask forgiveness into our lives, we are made new. Yes. And so, wow, like praise God for that. Not because of anything I've done and yes. not because of anything any of us can do for that salvation, but all because of what Christ has already done. Yes. And that's available for everyone and that's available for women that have, have had abortions. And so... Absolutely, I think that's an important question that we think about. Um, I think it takes a lot of compassion and mm -hmm. nuance as we approach it, which is, I think, mm -hmm. why we, we're trying to have this conversation right. and talk about kind of um, all these different aspects of the realities of abortion. Um, but at the end of the day, I want women to find freedom mm. um, in, in the gospel mm. and freedom in the hope that Jesus has offered. And so we, we don't shy away from truth because we believe that truth brings freedom, right? Amen. Amen. And so um, that, I think we have to take that spirit of humility, grace in with our truth yeah. as we love people um, and point to, point to God's truth. Amen. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Amen. Amen to that. Great question. Great answer. Another question. Um, so I wrote my question down because it's kind of long. Um, my name is Damar, and I'm a young artist from Atlanta. Um, and my question is about Ecclesiastes. So I just read it, and I want to know from someone who is, like, on the other side of the fence where I aspire to be. Um, obviously, the Bible says it's, like, foolish to seek your own glory. So I feel weird as an artist sometimes trying to push my own music, mm -hmm. even though much of it is, like, for the Lord. Yeah. So with that said, like, have you ever struggled with pride? And how would you say the Lord has, like— guided you in being a good steward of not just worldly, but also godly success? That's a good question. Great question. Great question. And the answer is no, I've never struggled with pride ever. <laughs> I, uh, never. I wish I could relate. I've read about it once. Um, no, I'm joking. 
Um, that's that's a good question. I think it's probably more um, relevant, particularly particularly for artists your age. Um, when I was coming up, we had just got rid of MySpace. I mean, do y'all right. even know what MySpace is? I you know. know what MySpace is, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> Tom. So it was Tom in MySpace, <laughs> and then we had Facebook. Yeah, like this. <laughs> um, and so I wasn't able to just take a device out of my pocket and see how liked I am at all times. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I wasn't constantly getting these endorphin hits of somebody commenting in my my uh, on my post, "You're the goat," or or uh, you know, fire emojis and stuff like that. Which is the thing. Those kind of comments is what every artist's fans are saying, you know what I'm saying? But right. it feels so customized to me. Like, man, maybe I am that guy. Um, I feel like you all are probably going to be inundated with that a lot more than than I did as I was coming up as as an artist, where I'm more on the, the sunset side of my career. You're on the sunrise. Um, so it's a great question. I, I would say, personally, my pride issues have often been around... Uh, not sh not being sure if God has put me in the right place. So like, um, it's still pride. It's uh, I I don't have a lot of beating my chest moments, but it, it's it's more of like, am I really called to do this? I struggled for many years when I signed the Reach Records because I thought God had made a mistake. Like like, why did you allow me to be on this label? I can't rap as good as these people. Uh, they've known each other forever, so I feel like a fly on the wall when I'm there. In fact, for a long time, everybody thought that I was an intern. Not everybody, but some people thought I was an intern uh. at Reach Records because I was just so on the outside. Yeah. And um, so I, 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 I had that. That had been a wrestle for me for a while. Um, I would say that the 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 way in which I have been able to address my pride is the same way that I would address that I would say anyone should address any kind of moments of I'm being too into me. You got to get really into Jesus, okay? Uh, it is not possible uh, in a human realm to get around Steph Curry and talk about how good your jump shot is. It'd be strange, right? You, you show him, hey, man, here's a shot. Here's, a, here's me making a, a half-court shot. I made three in a row. You would be, that would obviously be weird for you to talk to Steph Curry. For those, everyone knows Steph Curry's, right? It's not possible. It's not possible to not know who he is. Okay. Um, it's, it's just weird. And in, when you're in the presence of our God, right, and you're, you're able to see that I don't have oxygen on my own, right? I don't, I don't have a, a single talent that hasn't been given to me. Um, I see myself as I ought. And Paul would say, you shouldn't see yourself too low, but you also shouldn't see yourself too high either. Right. You should see yourself rightly and soberly, which is here I am by the grace of God and with my my time, my effort, I am going to do what God would have me to do. And here's what I think God would have you to do. Number one, God would have you to be as good as you possibly can at what you do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is not, you know, buying streams or trying to set up PR moments where people are talking about you. It's I practice. I made beats. I started off as a producer. I would spend 12 hours a day working on production. I would write a song every single day. I would, I would perform everywhere from jails, JDCs, railroad tracks, outside the club, mm -hmm. at Subway, Publix. I don't know if I got Publix up here. Kroger. Mm -hmm. I, wherever there was an open mic, I was there rapping about Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it at the time, but God was using that to give me my 10,000 hours that I needed so that when the opportunity presented itself uh, for me to, you know, basically see this turn into a career, I would be ready. And that is my service to God, brother. My, my, my being good at what I do or trying to be good at what I do and, 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 and moving in excellence, a excellence is a part of what God has called me to do. To not do it would be a kind of unfaithfulness, right? Mm -hmm. I think if you focus on that, I want to be faithful with the gifts God has given me. I want to stay in the presence of God so I can not begin to worship my gifts, which the internet wants me to do. Mm -hmm. The internet will help you to do that, okay? 
So I think having those two things, I am doing this and people are being blessed by it and I'm doing it well out of duty to my God for the skills he's given me. And I spend a lot of time in the presence of my God, remembering, being reminded of who I am. So last thing I'm going to say, I'm around a lot of your favorite Christian artists, okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of them. And if you do not cultivate a kind of heart of humility out the gate, when you do accomplish things and you get awards or sell out a show, you will not be able to enjoy it because only, the only thing you're going to be thinking about is how do I, A, do this again, or what's the next hit, mm -hmm. okay? What a awful place to be. Mm -hmm. I told God, do not, and I, the Lord I didn't need me to tell him this, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be any bigger than I need to be. I don't, I don't want to walk into any rooms that I'm not supposed I don't want nobody to give me money or to invest in me that I am not supposed to have in his sovereign will. Because what's more important than all of this is your holiness before God, your ability to enjoy him and enjoy loving people around you. If that is taken from you, you become a shell, you become a product, you become, we're all adults here, right? Yeah. I won't use that word. <laughs> you become... You become somebody who lives to be praised. Those are the smallest, most egocentric, uh, uh, unhappy people you will ever meet. And I'm telling you, Christian music does not insulate you from that. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So develop it now. We can probably take one more question, guys. I think we got two minutes. Can we get... Can we get Sis sister, sister, Blue, sister Blue shirt. Sister the Royal Blue. She been... <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you guys for speaking so boldly on the topic of life. Um, I get the privilege of working in the pro-life movement as well. Nice. Um, I'm the Students for Life president here at Liberty University. All right. Um, awesome. It's super awesome. And um, a big thing that we do is teach apologetics to students here um, as well as other college campuses. And we teach them how to defend their pro-life position nice. um, using the Bible and not. And so, you know, even though Roe v. Wade was overturned, hallelujah, <laughs> um, I would argue there's even more work to be done That's right. um, to make sure that women feel safe and secure in their option and really choosing life. So what would you say to like Generation Z, all of us um, and the upcoming generations, where would you like us to go? What would you like to see from us? Um, and what do you expect from us as we kind of enter into the workforce and really lead the charge from here on out? Ooh. Yeah. Can I, oh, you go first. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I, I love that you mentioned the the overturn of Roe v. Wade because we're talking about this issue, and that's obviously a big thing that's happened in right. our in our culture in recent times. And I, I know that some people, when Roe was overturned, kind of thought like, oh, like the the issue's done. But I would say, really, like we are just getting started. Yes. <laughs> because even if at the federal level the right to abortion has been overturned women are still facing unplanned pregnancies, seeking answers for what they're going to do, trying to figure out what, what the next step is. And so there are still women in need and there are still babies in the womb that are vulnerable yeah. Yeah. Um, to being uh, their life being taken. And so we, we have, I think, more need now than ever. And so the, I think, you know, Having apologetics is great. Like being able to know why you believe what you believe, being rooted in 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 kind of how to explain why you have a life conviction, a conviction mm. that stands for life, yes, yes. Um, is so important. Um, paired with uh, the real tangible willingness to, in obedience, step out mm. and care for those that are actually vulnerable. So. Amen to go and meet the women that yeah. are in the unplanned pregnancy and trying to figure out where to go, yeah, where to go, yeah. where to, where yes. to, for their, them to make that decision. And uh, at Stanford Life, we recently did some research about women's experience in facing unplanned pregnancies and where they go. And, and unfortunately, women admitted that they don't feel like they can go to friends or even family with an unplanned pregnancy for advice or help mm. about what to do. And so that really is heartbreaking to me. And, and faith communities were even lower than that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yes. The number one most trusted voice that women cited as helping them make a decision about a pregnancy was an organization that is the largest abortion provider in our country. Mm. So we have, I think, 
an uphill battle yeah. in in creating the type of communities, to the type of relationships where women feel like they can trust friends, their church community, their family with the hard decision of navigating, okay, I'm facing an unplanned pregnancy. I need to you know, like help me figure out what to do. And, and choosing life for that child is always going to be the right thing. But like it is a process and it is a journey that women, when they're facing really really challenging circumstances or even just pressures from yeah. their family or their their faith community or they're going to be, they know they're going to be ostracized. That is a hard place to be in. And I, I want women to feel like they can go to pro-life advocates, mm -hmm. churches, faith communities, and be met with compassion, care, resources, and love as we do also stand for wanting to keep that child uh, protected and that life saved. Um, and so considering where things are culturally in this moment, um, I think Roe has made that even more challenging. And I think mm -hmm. research, our recent research showed that. But that, you know, we as people of God know that we have truth on our yes. sides and we have hope on our side. Yeah. And so we should be the most hopeful people as we, and, and the most loving people as we engage in this work to, to hopefully show women that we can be a safe place for them and that we care for them. So hopefully that will be the direction we go. Yeah, you know, that's it. my prayer for yeah. uh, our, you know, the work that we have to do amidst yeah. uh, an intense time uh, culturally around yeah. this issue. Yeah, can, um, I, can I just piggyback off of that just a little bit? Sure. I think that what you said, I love what you said because when Roe v. Wade was overturned, I think everyone was rejoicing, including me. Um, but the question then became, I remember folks were asking, now that Roe v. Wade is overturned, we are going to see what the pro-life people were really about. Mm. Because if Roe v. Wade got overturned and that was it, then we know, oh, this wasn't really about the women at all. This was just about the agenda, yeah. right? But now that Roe v. Wade is overturned, as you said, the question then becomes now is now is there going to be resources in place to help women who are in need, yeah. right? And uh, I think that there's a lot of different ways that that could be done. Stand for Life is, is, is seeking to do that. So again, making that place to Stand for Life using the resources that Stand for Life has. But there's there's a church that is, that is in my community that I know of that they have a whole ministry that's volunteering at uh, crisis pregnancy centers yeah. Yeah. with women, right? Yeah. Um, so they're like, we're not just talking about being like pro-life. We're actually at these centers caring for women babysitting their kids, mm -hmm. giving them resources, trying to find them housing. They'll, those are the, that's the kind of stuff that we want to do because in my, uh, at the time before Roe v. Wade was overturned, one of the things that we were talking about on the podcast is that we were saying, we want Christians to create a culture of life uh, that is so uh, robust that if Roe v. Wade was never overturned, women would still, see, there would be such a culture in life that women would say, well, I don't, there's no need for me to get an abortion, mm -hmm. even if I can, right? And I think that even over that being overturned, the goal is to create that culture of life and the resources and the institutional resources to be available that women could say, oh no, I do have options other than terminating this pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And I can go to these faith-based institutions to actually get the help that I need and not be shamed mm, for it, yeah. right? Because they actually see that yeah. I am just, I am a person that is in need again. And so I think that it's, we have to have a plan of what we are going to do now. It's almost like if somebody is in the presidency and everybody was like, we want a person out. We want this person out. They fight so hard to get them out. And now they're in the seat and everybody's like, now what? <laughs> and they were like, oh, well, we don't know what to do because we didn't actually think we would get here. So we don't have a plan. Uh -huh. Right. But I think that we as pro-life believers have to have a plan of how we're going to create a culture of life. Yep. It can't just be overturning Roe v. Wade and it can't can't just be only like we're just trying to prevent abortions from happening, though we must do that. Yeah. We must do that. Yeah. But what is the plan to actually have the resources in place and the compassion and care and love in place to actually help women and families that are in need when it comes to this? And I think that that's what those are the kind of things that we can be praying for. God, show me, show Whatever ministry I'm running, whatever I'm a part of, show us how we can be resourceful. Show us how we can actually be the hands and feet of Jesus to give uh, those who are broken and vulnerable what they need to actually be able to keep their ch their child, but not only keep their child, but flourish with this Ooh, child. 
That's the you word. know what I mean? And that's, that's that should be the goal. The goal the should word. not just be to overturn Roe v. Wade, though that's great, and I'm glad that happened. The goal should be, God, how do we help them, them flourish? Yeah. Right. That's good. And and how do we create that? God, show me how to create that and point me to the people who are creating that. Let me partner with them. So I think that that should be our heart. And it's an uphill battle, but I think that it could be done. Yep. Um, it's going to take some time. Yep. Yep. But God is a, sometimes God. God is not when we say God is not a microwave. He's God. not a microwave. He's God. not a hot pocket. God. He's not a hot He's pocket. He's a slow God. roast. It's a slow ro- roast. Uh, but, you know, as you know, slow roasted cooking oh is my. usually always better. Oh, if you're from the right? South, you know that. You know that. Right. And so I think that that's what we what 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 we will see with the Lord when it comes to this issue of life is that it's a slow roast, but we must be patient enough to say we are gonna we are gonna mm-hmm. turn this thing as many times as we need until it's until it's it's cooking well. Amazing. And yeah. as people of faith, we we can take the slow roast view because mm-hmm. we know the God of eternity. Right? Amen. Like, you don't say have that, Lord. to be like it's got it's no like God is the God of eternity. Yes. He's the God of all time. He was and is and always will be. Amen. And so like we. We live in his timeline yes. of, okay, what do we do to be faithful in the moment we have here? Yes, and that's absolutely. It. Amen. I love it. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this has been another episode of Southside Rabbi live in Virginia. Hey! Uh-huh. <laughs> two up, two down. Uh, two up, two down um, with, the, with, with the wonderful Lauren <laughs> Green McAfee. Make some noise for her one time. My name is uh, KB. I mean I the think. dream. And I, I, I think. <laughs> My name is KB. I mean the dream. This episode <sighs> was brought to you by Stand for Life. Yes. We will see you soon. Peace.